Hey everyone, I just wanted to let you guys know that I started up a Patreon page for the show. If you're interested in helping out the show, just head over to patreon.com slash Joshua Bellis and become a $5 backer today. Some of the main benefits you'll get from being a backer on the Patreon page is you'll clearly get early access to the episodes earlier in advance than everybody else. So obviously that will make me record the episodes a lot earlier so that you guys would get that access sooner compared to everybody else. And if you become a $10 backer or more on Patreon, then you'll get special access to special videos made from me. These will be raw, unedited videos straight from me discussing over serious things going on with me and just more of day in the life videos from me. So they'll include life advice to how I manage my time being a college student and a podcast host. But without further ado, let's get right into today's episode. You're listening to the Augmented Experience Podcast. My name is Joshua Bellas. I'm a student, musician, and a gamer at heart. Join me as I sit down with fellow enthusiasts to talk about what's going on in the technology, business, and gaming world. I hope you guys enjoy. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. My name is Joshua Bellas, and today we're going to talk about the topic that you guys voted about on the Instagram page. So, I'm, I'm assuming it's quite obvious because most of you voted on the page, but today's episode is going to be me talking about tech advice. So, when I say tech advice, what do I mean by that? Well, this is mainly going to be a more technical episode where I'm going to go into more specific things regarding technology and what to look for and what not to look for for specific things. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. There's some things I won't cover specifically, especially because headphones and earbuds are very subjective, especially because everybody's going to hear things differently compared to everyone else. Like not everybody's hearing is the same. Not every earbud is going to feel the same way in everybody's ears. So with those, I'm not really going to give you so much detail in that, but I will give you possible recommendations based on what I've learned and feedback I've gotten from other people regarding those things. So what are we going to start with today? I'm going to start with laptops because I feel like since most of my audience is probably like college students or people that are interested in buying laptops or PCs in general, I feel like this is probably a great place to start, especially because we're going to be addressing the necessity of a i5, a core i5 versus a core i7. So what are those things? Well, The Core i5 and the Core i7 are CPUs made by Intel. Intel are the people that make basically the CPUs inside of most computers nowadays. Obviously, AMD makes their own CPUs, but I'm going to save that for a little bit later in a later part of the episode. So for college students, what do I recommend? Do I recommend that you buy a laptop that has a Core i5 or a Core i7? And for this part, I'm mainly going to split it up into two because it's quite simple. If you are somebody that does not do a lot of heavy video editing or CAD designing, then I do not recommend that you get a Core i7 laptop because you will not need it. You will not use that CPU to its fullest potential, especially since those are cores meant to run those heavier tasks to do that. And so what do I recommend? Obviously, I'm going to recommend that you get a Core i5. Not only will it be cheap, and it will save you some money, and that money can be used somewhere else. And it's overall the best bang for your buck, especially if you're somebody that, say, you're doing business and you like crunching numbers, or you're just somebody that's going to use it just to take notes and just watch videos on it. Then, obviously, for me, just get a Core i5, because that's personally what's more suited for that. That's not saying that the Core i5 is not capable. It's just the core i7 should be reserved for the most heavier tasks because that's what they were designed to do now what laptops do i recommend in that core i5 range obviously this really splits down into two categories depending on how you want to view it so if you like mac os more than windows then i would look at the macbook lines personally like i mentioned before the core i7 and the core i5 If you are not doing heavy video editing or CAD designing, do not get a MacBook Pro. You will not need that power. It's not needed for you or it's not meant for you. It's more of a professional product. That's why it has Pro in the name. I personally would recommend the MacBook Air, the new one that just came out, obviously. Well, I say new, but it came out in 2018, but late 2018, so it's still new. I would personally recommend the 
MacBook Air, the 13 inch retina display one. It has a Core i5, 120 gigabyte SSD inside. Clock speed is 1.6 gigahertz. And personally, that is the main one that I would recommend if you like Mac OS. If you don't like Mac OS, then your options are a little bit easier, I would say, because there are some that I do have in mind that do help you guys out a lot. So let's go to the HP side of computers. When it comes to HP, I know this is gonna be a contradiction to what I just said, but based on how much HP selling this laptop, this is the one instance where I would recommend you could go for a Core 7 because you can get it for a good price. And that would be the HP MV 13 inch laptop. This one's gonna have an Intel Core i7 8550U. I'll explain that in a bit too. 8 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabyte SSD, Windows 10 installed. It's an Ultrabook, it's a affordable Ultrabook. So when people use the term Ultrabook, that really just means premium laptop that's like top of the line. So personally, that's the one I would recommend, especially since it's on sale for $879. Especially for college students, that's more than enough than any college student will use. And it's perfectly capable to do anything you want it to do. And then obviously, I'm gonna bring up the Surface laptops and the Surface Pros. There's a reason I'm not gonna say the books because I'm gonna to get to that in a bit. So the Surface laptop and the Surface Pros, in my opinion, are the best option for Windows laptops if you are just using it for like taking notes and stuff like that. They are my personal recommendation for Windows laptops because not only are they straight from Microsoft, they're built incredibly well, they're very minimalist, they're very manageable, they're not overbearing, they don't weigh a lot. So obviously they're gonna be something you can carry around with you very easily. It's not gonna be an issue to walk around with that because I believe they're like three pounds and the Surface Pro is less than that. Obviously, yes, you are paying a more premium for it since it is straight from the Microsoft Store, but Microsoft does offer student discounts, so it does help. For me, if you like Windows, those are the two laptops I'd recommend you go for without any hesitation. They're really good. Obviously, the more modern design and more modern ports definitely help out a lot. And obviously, they're very minimalist. And obviously how in today's day and age, most people prefer a minimalist design over something that's over the top. Now, for the gamers out there, this is where it gets a little bit more trickier because gaming is very, I'd argue it's subjective depending on how much you wanna spend. Because depending on how much you spend is how good the product will be. Now, when it comes to laptops, if you're somebody that doesn't like a gaming PC tower and you wanna have a laptop with you, you really have to think about, okay, how much do I want this thing to weigh? And how big do I want the screen? And how good is the stuff inside? And price comparing and stuff like that. So, for the gaming laptop space, I'm personally gonna recommend three laptops and they are gonna be in the $1,000 price range because I believe in this price range, this is where you get the most bang for your buck because that's mainly what you're trying to do is you're trying to get as much bang for your buck. You're trying to get as much of a good product for how much you're spending. So two laptops, I'd argue that are mainly are in competition with one another. And that would be the Acer Helios Predator 300 and my HP Omen 15. These two laptops are the main competitors for the $1,000 price range. Not only because they are the most souped up $1,000 laptops you are possibly gonna find, depending especially the Acer Predator 300, I'm just gonna call it that. That one is gonna be $1,099, but the benefits you get with these laptops is obviously they're gonna have the full six gigabyte VRAM 1060, so that's really good, so you'll be able to run any modern game at full max settings without any issues and they also have not the full but at least a very beefy version of the i7 8700 obviously it's not going to be the pc one which is the k version it will have an h version so it's going to be very capable it's going to clock up to 4.0 gigahertz so it's going to be really beefy for if you're really doing intensive gaming and even graphic designing and engineering in general or cad designing it's really powerful and also these things can edit videos very easily without any issues at all because they're gonna be having 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now, the main difference between the two, it really comes down to how you want it to look and the display. 
The Predator 300 is going to have 144 hertz display. For gaming, that is incredibly good to have a 1080p 144 hertz display, especially because the more refresh rate your screen has, the better it is and how smooth and buttery the game flows. Unfortunately, the HP Omen is only capped out at a 60 hertz screen, but it makes up for that in the fact that it's not as aggressive with its design as the Predator because the Predator screams gamer. Like it's all black, red, it has the big Predator logo and the thing is pretty big, it's pretty hefty. And the HP Omen, obviously it is gonna have some gaming and gaming style design to it, but it is more minimalist. It is, it's more, I'd argue modern, modern design looking, especially cause it's not as, it's not as heavy as the, as the Predator 300 and it's also not as thick as it. The Predator 300 is meant to be a big boy. It's still like five pounds and same as the Omen. The Omen's five pounds as well. It's just that the Omen screen is gonna be a lot slimmer bezels. So it's gonna look a lot nicer even though it doesn't have as good as a display as the 300. But the main benefit is that Micro Center is selling the maxed out version of the HP Omen 15 for $1,000 clean. So $999.99. And that is a huge benefit, especially cause for the Predator 300, it's gonna cost you $1,099, but that's as long as Amazon has it on discount. And the main issue people are having with the 300 is that it thermal throttles a lot. So thermal throttling basically means that your laptop gets so hot that it has to lower its clock speed because it can't handle the heat. And the 300 has a really bad issue with thermal throttling. The HP Omen does get hot, but it can be easily fixed with some software tweaking and a recent bio update that just came out and it really helped the thermals a lot so it's not getting as hot as the Acer and it won't thermal throttle especially. So I think it really comes down to, do you wanna spend the extra $100 for a better display, but you have a higher chance of not really utilizing that machine to its fullest potential or be fine with a lower display, but at least more nicer looking design language and obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna side with my omen more because that's the main reason that I got the omen over the 300 because I had originally bought the 300 but based on some things that were going on with Amazon and you know how I felt about it I just decided to change last minute return the order and got the omen at Micro Center and it's been perfectly great with me I've loved this laptop and obviously one thing you guys have to keep in mind with gaming laptops is battery life sucks that's just how that is they're not because they're running very powerful cpus and gpus at the same time so they're very power hungry so these things should always be used with the charger connected however like i mentioned before there's a third option that third option is the dell g7 the only reason i don't recommend the g7 as much even though yes it has the cleanest looking design out of all of them it doesn't scream gamer it's very minimalist it looks like a professional laptop it just doesn't have the same specs for the price and how much they're asking for it. The specs don't line up. And at the same time, it thermal throttles a lot. So it's not really worth it in my opinion because I would argue that a thermal throttle is even worse than the Acer 300. But that's obviously subjective. But what's not subjective is the price and what you get for that price. That's why I'm not gonna say the Dell G7 is a go for me. Now, we're gonna go on the Ultrabooks. <clears throat> the Ultrabooks, this is where things get a little bit tricky because Ultrabooks are gonna range from the 1,500 to two grand range or more. So, like I said, we have a lot of good competitors in this range. Recently, Razer stepped up their game and decided to be part of this, of this tier bracket with the Razer Blade 15. The Razer Blade 15 comes out about $1,599, so close to $1,600, but it offers a really good bang for the buck with some minor hiccups. Obviously, it doesn't have an SSD. It's gonna be a hard drive instead. And, you know, obviously Razer's customer support isn't as reliable compared to these other two that I'm gonna bring up right now. And, well, it does have benefits as well because the keyboard is arguably really nice. It has good thermals, really good battery life for a laptop that's 
kind of a hybrid of a gaming and an ultra book but it is more leaning towards an ultra book and it has a really great display especially if you upgrade to the 4k display option it gets really good and i can't really say much bad things about this laptop because personally it is a great laptop now what are its competitors the main two competitors are obviously going to be the macbook pro and the surface book 2. now the, i know what you guys are thinking the surface book 2 it is crazy on how much they're charging for that thing like they're charging close to two grand plus for that thing but it's meant for engineering students or CAD designers it's really meant for that especially because what Microsoft put inside of it and how they advertise it as the workhorse laptop but there's also another one that comes into play from Windows and I'm gonna bring that up it's the Dell XPS 15 the Dell XPS 15 is very popular with students that love ultrabooks but they're really pricey as well. Dell outdoes themselves because they put a lot of attention into the XPS line. The XPS gets a lot of love. It's basically tested hardware that's just great. And I think that's what makes it really good and really handy to have around because you can obviously are guaranteed that the keyboard is gonna be great. That's just a fact. Obviously, it also has the same issues as the new MacBook Pros where thermal throttles with the Core i9, but that's because it's the Core i9 and the Core i9 just naturally overheats. It's gonna thermal throttle no matter what you do because it's a really hard processor to cool unless if you have a really big gaming laptop that can properly cool that sucker so that it's running at its full capacity. But obviously gaming laptops that have a Core i9, these things are massive bricks that weigh like over 10 pounds. I don't think you guys want to be carrying 10 pounds with you everywhere you go. That's just, that's a no-go. Those are, those laptops are considered desktop replacements because of what they have inside of them. But back to the Ultrabooks. So the Ultrabooks, MacBook Pro, if you like Mac OS and you really want the best Apple has, even though I'm going to be honest, I do not like the MacBook Pros because of the thermal throttling issues and obviously i don't think that they can be really resolved until next year until apple decides how they want to redesign it and maybe change its language to see that we can get something a little bit more suitable to handle that processor but there's also another person coming into the competition and it's huawei huawei made the make the matebook x pro obviously people are going to say it looks like a macbook clone but for windows that's a really good compliment because it's really slim in design really modern looking aesthetic it obviously looks like a macbook and overall out of the windows it has one of the cleaner version of windows besides them besides the surface laptops themselves the surface laptops those are clearly going to have pure windows without any much of an issue and yeah that's really all i can say about the laptop space so now we're going to go on to this is where it gets a little bit more fun because we're going to go into smartphones so this is the easiest thing to do if you like apple there's a high chance no matter what i say you're never switching from apple the apple ecosystem for many people is just too good that they just don't want to switch to them it's too convenient it's too i'm not going to say very reliable because that's also an understatement because there's been many moments and instances where ios has not been reliable i'm mainly referring to ios 11 which was literally one of the worst launches of any iOS update, period, in today's history. It is the worst launch. It had a lot of issues when it came out. And Apple had to constantly keep updating that sucker just to get it to work. And it's really bad. But obviously, I will admit, iPhones, many people can consider them, they are the business phone. And what do I mean by that? So when you go around to a business, really high-end business, there's only two type of phones you're going to see. You're either going to see the most expensive Android or you're going to see an iPhone. Most of the time, you're going to see an iPhone, but that's because that's how Apple brands themselves. Apple brands themselves as a very premium item that they are the peak of technology. Obviously, that is debatable, especially because given how the smart smartphone market currently is and how far it's advanced, I just don't think that Apple can be considered the peak of smartphone design. Obviously, I will admit that Apple has been making incredible strides recently in regards to their chipsets because that's, I would argue, that's Apple's best factor going for them. 
is that their chips are just ridiculous, that they're just blowing the competition out of the water. Now, when it comes to design language, it, it's really subjective, but I can, I can say from my own opinion, I do not like the notch. I think that it was not the proper approach to handling a more bezel-less display, and I just felt that it was a lack of innovation rather than trying to push boundaries. Obviously this year, we're going to see a change to that because Samsung's coming out with a, a more suitable replacement to the notch, but some it will piss off some people, I'm going to be real with you guys, which is a hole in the display, but it gets rid of the notch, but there's a hole in the display. But the main end goal is eventually smartphones, people want to be in the position where the cameras are under the display and everything is under the display, fingerprint sensor, cameras under the display, so that we can have a truly bezel-less phone. Do I believe that we're many, many years off from that? Yes, I believe we are, especially because given how the smartphone market is currently in a decline right now, I don't really see that much innovation going on, but I will admit that some companies will push boundaries in different ways. Obviously, that's why Apple's pushing more towards a, a services rather than trying to push out new products now. They're starting to change up how they want to present themselves. But when it comes to smartphones, Best iPhone you can probably buy right now? I would say it's the XR. I think for the money and what you get for it, the XR is clearly the better choice out of all three of the iPhones. It's better than the Max. It's better than the XS. The reason I say it's better than the Max is it has a bigger battery. The battery will last longer due to this, the display not being as high quality as the Max, but at the same time, it's also bigger than the XS. It can have a bigger battery and they all share the same camera and they show the same processor. That was the big difference because people were expecting that the XR was gonna have a downgraded processor, but it didn't. And I think that's what makes it really popular with people is that it has the same processor, the camera's the same. Obviously it doesn't have the second lens, but that's perfectly fine. People don't really care about the second lens as much. But my point still stands. The XR is still the best iPhone you can buy right now. When it comes to Androids, this is where it gets subjective because if you want a phone that can do anything, I wouldn't say anything you want, but has the most features possible, the Samsung Note 9 is a great option. Obviously, I would hold off on that and wait till the S10s because we're literally on the corner of having the S10s release. The S10s are basically Samsung's 10th anniversary phone, and those are right around the corner. So if you want to wait, and see how those phones are, what the prices are looking like, then go right ahead. But if you just want a new phone right now and you want overall the most complete package of a phone, the Note 9 is your choice. If you like really good software, fast performance, and a lot of future-proofing in terms of specs, the OnePlus 6T is my go-to. Personally, I love OnePlus as a company. I've been completely astonished with how much strides they made in technology and how they've progressed in promoting themselves as a legit player in the smartphone market, especially that now they are the first Chinese company to become a partner with carriers in the US. And that's really huge because given the current state of things with the US and China, it's really surprising that they were able to do that. So the only phone that can really rival the OnePlus in terms of software is the Google Pixels. Obviously, like I've mentioned before, the Google Pixels are an enthusiast phone. They're not meant for everybody. The Google Pixels were originally designed to convert people from iPhone to Android because that's what Google's really trying to do is trying to replicate the magic that Apple has. Obviously, the main thing that Google succeeds at compared to everybody else is cameras. Google offers one of the best cameras just to take, you can literally just point the camera at something, click the button, and you have a perfect photo. You don't have to go into the settings and edit it yourself or rely on raw hardware power to get a good picture. The software does all the work for you. And I think that's what's helping out Google in their case and what pushes their popularity and why a lot of tech savvy people recommend it for the camera. Obviously, hardware wise, I will admit Google is slacking and I think they need to step up their game more. So we're going to see what happens this year to see what the Pixel 4 will offer. Now. I'm going to talk about headphones and earbuds a bit because I can provide at least some recommendations best based on what I've heard and what I've used. So when it comes to headphones, I'm going to say this now, and it's probably going to piss off a lot of people. Beats suck. 
in reality, that's a fact. Based on audiophile, audiophile is a term to describe people that truly listen to audio and really appreciate how good it sounds. Beats are just terrible. In my opinion, they're not really good and they're overpriced for what they really should be. I do not believe that Beats are incredible headphones. I can admit if you're just a casual listener and you probably just don't care and you just like Beats, it's not gonna change your mind. But if I were to put it, say, a pair of Audio Technicas on you, you're gonna see why people don't like Beats. Now, when it comes to earbuds, and I'll go back to headphones in a bit, but I wanna talk about earbuds because this is a little bit easier for me. If you have an iPhone, get AirPods. Why do I say get AirPods, even though I have a strong opinion against them, is they're just personally the best headphones Apple has made. Obviously, do I think that they're overpriced? Yes, especially because they're exactly the same thing as the Apple earbuds you get in your phone just without the cable, but they're just truly wireless. But I will admit that I understand why Apple charges a good premium for them, especially because they were the first truly wireless earbuds and they work, they're very functional and people really like them. They like the design language of them and that's what I would argue is what sells them really well. And, but if you don't wanna get AirPods and you just like a good pair of earbuds, in my opinion, I would recommend the Jaybird X4s or the Taros. For me, Jaybird has been making really good earbuds for the past few years. I had the X3s recently and before they came out the X4s, I love the X3s but when I saw that the X4s came out, I decided to return them because I liked the new updated look of the X4 and it just made it more convenient. And they added water resistance to them, so that was a, that was a clear indication for me, these are a go. And they sound great, the app allows you to amplify the sound and make them sound better. So for me, it's a win. And the Tara Pro just came out and based on what I'm hearing, they're really good. The cable is really interesting because they decided to go with a nylon braided one for the headphone cable and I thought that was really interesting. So in terms of durability, it's gonna be interesting to see how that works out, especially because nylon is very durable. So the fact that it's on a pair of headphones or specifically earbuds, cause that's what they're called, earbuds, it's gonna be cool to see how this works out. Now, going back to headphones. If you are somebody that likes to mix audio or do DJ work and stuff like that, I have two pair of headphones that I'd recommend if you're starting out. If you're starting out, I would recommend getting a pair of Audio-Technica M40Xs or a pair of Sennheiser's 280 Pros. These two headphones, based on what I've seen and personal experience, because I have the 280 Pros, they are the most accurate you're gonna get to the most flat sound when it comes to listening to audio files. Because when you're mixing audio, you want a true representation of what you're listening to. You want a flat sound, you don't want a colored sound. So having a flatter sound helps out tremendously, especially for listening to the accuracy of what you're listening to. And because if you have a good bass, then you can balance it correctly. Now, why aren't I recommending the M50s? The only reason I don't recommend the M50s for mixing audio is due to the fact that they add too much color. It adds color and that's what kind of degrades them for being studio monitoring headphones because that's not the point of studio monitoring. The point of studio monitoring headphones is to provide you a true representation of sound, to have no color. Now, as a casual listener, yes, I would recommend the 50s because obviously they color the sound a little bit and that's what, for some people, they prefer adding color to the sound. They like having their sound sound better because of something the headphone's doing. So that's clearly a benefit as well. And let's see, which is another really good headset? Oh yeah, I forgot the Bluetooth wireless ones. This is where it gets, I'd say easier because there's three main Bluetooth wireless headphones that I can easily recommend. Microsoft headphones that just recently came out. These are active noise canceling headphones, really good, updated ports. It's sound is a little bit lacking. I'm not gonna lie, but that's something that's a trade off with noise canceling headphones is you're reducing the overall sound that you hear on the outside, but you're also giving up a little bit of that sound quality. Obviously the popular choice is the, is the Bose QC35 twos. Those have been really popular. Those are some of Bose's best selling headphones ever. They're noise canceling. Obviously Bose prides themselves in being the best noise canceling headphones on the market. 
Obviously its port selection is a little bit lacking, but that can be forgiven because of the noise canceling. And clearly the new winner for best noise canceling headphones because they get rid of that stigma of trading away sound for noise canceling because this one actually gives you the best of both worlds. And it's a Sony WH-1000XM3. These are just, in many people's opinions, they're really considered incredible. Not only because they give you an app that allows you to control how you want the headphones to sound, its controls are more modern, so they're very touch sensitive and not relying on buttons. It has a USB-C port to charge them. So instead of using micro USB, it's now USB type C. So more modern ports. And at the same time, it, they're very comfortable based on what I'm hearing about them. Obviously, yes, these three headphones are the same price range. They're, all three of them are $350. But that's because, you know, that's what they're meant for. Is They're meant as more of a luxury product. They're not a necessity. Now, what's another one that I want? talk about hmm. oh yeah tablets i don't really think i need to talk about tablets that much because i think this is pretty much straightforward the ipads are basically the best tablets you can buy android has not made anything that can even come close to competing with the ipads that's just a fact android can't people say what about the samsung tab s4 it's not as good as an ipad it's gonna it lags a lot it's already shown that it's lagging heavily in the ipads you could have an iPad Air 2 and it still wouldn't be lagging. And that's a five-year-old tablet. You get what I'm saying? Like, Apple just dominates the tablet game. They're not losing their grip on that. And I honestly believe that's not changing anytime soon. I know that that kind of sounds kind of depressing, but just the truth is, I will admit, Apple makes great tablets. I personally love the Pros more than the regulars because the Pros, obviously, I just prefer having more horsepower under the hood. And it does help out a lot in many situations now what else did i want to talk about when it comes to technology advice hmm. oh yeah now i remember pcs i did skip over this after the laptop section so when it comes to pcs what do i recommend building it or buying i think it really just comes down to the level of expertise you want to that you have or the people you have around you because Building a PC isn't as complicated as it was a long time ago. It's not. You can look up videos and look up tutorials and follow them beat for beat how to build a PC. However, there are just some people that even if they have the tutorial right there in front of them, they just don't feel comfortable building it. And that's understandable. Like They feel like they're going to mess it up because obviously if you build it, that's one of the, the risks that you encounter is that you know, if something goes wrong, you have to figure it out. No one can help you figure it out. Unless if you have somebody around you that knows how to build them, then obviously, yes, then you're good. But if you're just somebody that doesn't have anybody in your life that knows how to build PCs or put them together and you mess something up, you have to figure it out. And obviously when you buy a PC, then you don't have to worry about that because you can just call a hotline and they'll tell you how to fix it or they'll send somebody over and fix it. So... I think it just really comes down to preferences. And at the same time, when it comes to building them, you mainly have to look for discounted sales. This is where building PCs can be really, really good. Because if you can get the parts for cheaper, your overall, say, I wanna build a $1,000 PC. I have a $1,000 budget. However, I decide to get all the parts on Black Friday or Cyber Monday. I will drastically reduce the price of that $1,000 computer to say maybe 700 to 800. So I just saved myself $200. So with that $200, I can probably buy a nicer keyboard, a nicer mouse. I could probably buy, buy myself a better headset. I can buy a really good monitor for $200. And there's a lot of cost or cost management that really comes into building a PC because that's what you have to be mindful of is how much are you spending and are you looking for the deals and are you trying to hustle to get the parts that you want. So that's what I recommend for PC building or PC gaming if you want to get a tower. But there is one PC that I will recommend for people that just want to buy a PC already built. Aha, here it is. So yeah, the PC that I would recommend if you're starting PC gaming is the CyberPower PC 
And this one is going to have a Intel Core i5-8400. Its base clock is 2.8 gigahertz. It's gonna have eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. It's gonna have the three gigabyte VRAM 1060. It's gonna have a 120 gigabyte SSD, a one terabyte hard drive, and obviously it's gonna run Windows. And it's really good for the price because it's gonna be $849 and it comes with a free keyboard and mouse from Crosshair or CyberPower, my bad. So for the price, it's not bad because you can obviously upgrade it. It's on discount right now. And since it is upgradable, you can swap out the graphics card and get the six gigabyte VRAM version of the 1060 for cheaper. So you can sell the 1060 that's inside of it and then get the other 1060. So technically you're gonna get a chunk of change in your pocket again. And then obviously you can add in more RAM so you can sell that eight gigabyte RAM or you can use it and just buy yourself another one and, or sell that eight gigabyte stick to somebody for a good change. You can replace the SSD and the hard drive. Obviously the CPU, I think you can also replace it too because it does say that everything inside of it can be replaced. It has really good port selection. It's really nice looking, proper cooling specifically for the PC. So it does help out that it can be properly cool. A lot of the reviews say that the PC tower comes in very good condition. It's very well protected when wrapped. So this gets a good seal of recommendation from me. But with that said, I think that's really all the advice I can give you guys when it comes to technology. But I just want you guys to take this piece of advice with you. For me, when it comes to technology, it's just really a, it's addressing what do I need this for? And that helps me the most because that allows me to really think about why do I need this machine? And in order to do my job, what do I need to do it? So that's the piece of advice I'm gonna leave you guys with that because I feel like that's how you should address when it comes to technology or buying technology is why do I need this? What am I gonna use it for? And you know, what am I looking for specifically? So with that said, guys, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode and coming back and having you know, a form of discussion with me about this stuff. And I hope you guys just have a great weekend. I know I got a long week ahead of me, especially with a lot of stuff going on with school. You guys have a blessed day. I love you guys so much. Peace out, guys.